So uh, my name is Rui Miguel Abreu, and I'm here with Yvette Janine Jackson and also Judith Amen, I hope I am pronouncing the names correctly. Um, so, uh, and first of all, um, I want to welcome you into the Semibrev 2021 um, edition, of course, and start by asking you to introduce yourselves, please. Sure, um, I'm Yvette Janine Jackson. I'm a composer and sound uh, artist, installation, sound installation artist. Um, based in, um, well, I'm from California, but currently based on the East Coast of the United States. And uh, my name's Judith Hammond, and I'm a cellist, uh, performer, composer from so-called Australia, but I'm currently uh, based in Berlin due to COVID. Um, I think we should start by uh, exploring how you two have met. Sure. I think we met eight or nine years ago. Yeah, um, I was actually thinking earlier today that we've been working together for like nearly a decade. Right, yeah. Wild. So, yeah, no, I'm excited about that and hope there's decades more. But um, yeah, the first idea I had for like a radio opera project, um, Judith has been there from day one on, on the evolution of um, these compositions series that I've been doing. So, Okay, and uh, is there a, a, um, some kind of musical story behind uh, how you two, how you, you know, your paths have crossed um, the first time? Well, we were both studying, um, doing our doctoral studies at UC San Diego. Uh, I think perhaps actually we first met in Anthony Davis's opera class. Okay. <laughs> I was actually thinking that San Diego must have been the place where you met because I was reading both your uh, biographies and you mentioned studying uh, there. So I thought it's too much of a coincidence. Probably that's where uh, they, they met for, uh, firsthand. Yeah, you got us. <laughs> your, pow your powers of deduction are strong. Yeah, my, my middle name is Sherlock. Okay. Um, you know, uh, let me, uh, Yvette, concentrate on you now uh, for a, a minute or two. Um, you mentioned about being influenced by radio dramas uh, from the 30s, 40s, and, and, and 50s. Um, those works uh, had a great impact on the listeners uh, at a time when TV was um, basically in its infancy, or maybe even not around. In Portugal, for instance, it only started in 1958. So um, those uh, kinds of works for radio were really important. I'm, I'm just going to share with you a very, very uh, little uh, history that uh, it's happened to me. Um, when I was, I think, 11 years old, this must have been in 1980, um, uh, the Portuguese National Radio put on their own uh, version, their own production of, you know, Orson Welles' um, War of the Worlds radio drama. And it generated the panic in Portugal. I was actually quite excited at the prospect of meeting aliens in my back garden, I must say. But it goes to show the power of that medium and the power of those um, radio dramas, like you call them. Yeah, I mean, I think my first exposure to radio drama, um, I was also around the same age. My mother um, taught and was an administrator in a public school in Los Angeles which had a very strong um, theater program. And so after I was done with school, I would go and wait while she finished work and I would join some of the recreation clubs with the older um, students. And so in one of these classes, I think the first radio drama that I heard was Sorry, Wrong Number um, with a, a script by Lisa Fletcher who, whose radio dramas um, definitely uh, recur thematically in my own works. But um, yeah, there was something about um, this idea of images being created in the mind just based on um, the combination of sound effects and music and dialogue that has interest me. Um, but equally, equal to radio drama as an influence, um, theater in general has been an mm -hmm. influence. So I spent 10 and a half years in the San Francisco Bay Area um, working in radio, drama, and theater, 
and always had this idea of composing theater. So not composing for theater, but composing theater itself um, and using the dialogue and effects um, and other elements as composition material. Mm -hmm. um, it reminded me uh, of also, you know, the, 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 the language of sound college, like John Cage uh, did with Williams Mix, uh, for instance, or even what I'm not sure if you are aware of the work in England of the radiophonic workshop, this collective inside the BBC that, that used to um, create sound for um, TV dramas, et cetera, et cetera, also for, uh, for, for, for uh, radio. But I, I wanted to go back a little bit just for um, to discuss, you know, we live in this, um, um, Judith is wearing headphones. Uh, uh, we, we live in this high tech, um, <laughs> audio environment nowadays with you know 5.1 uh, sound in cinemas etc and sound is is being now um, sold to us as an immersive uh, experience but back then these um, works in the 30s and 40s the technology was not that advanced in terms of acoustics um, but it, it still had a strong impact wh wh why do you think that that was um i think Partly, um, I mean, partly, I suspect maybe the novelty of radio was captivating, mm -hmm. um, you know, in itself. But I mean, you can even predate it to radio um, with the theatrophone or the electrophone, which, which um, was invented in the late 19th century, where, you know, people could be in a listening parlor and have, you know, Parisian theater or opera piped in to mm -hmm. a location and be listening acousmatically. So, I mean, I think things like, you know, the, that invention or even the telephone itself, um, this idea of listening to someone from a far distance um, is captivating in a way. But I think also, you know, just the psychology of radio, the power of suggestion of text, um, the use of sound effects to, um, evoke imagination. Um, I mean, as a, as a modern listener, when I listen to some really early radio dramas that don't have any sound effects or music, it is, you know, hard for me to engage. They're interesting as an artifact, but um, I think once you get into, you know, pieces around the Second War World War um, that have this, to me, interesting balance of all of um, these elements, it becomes interesting. But also, I mean, you mentioned John Cage, and there was a program in the U.S. called the Columbia Workshop, mm -hmm. which um, its uh, producer director Irving Reese invited, you know, all types of um, writers and composers and actors to participate. And John Cage's "The City Wears a Slouch Hat" was, um, you know, premiered on this this program. And so, his original idea that got modified before the performance is definitely. Um, a motivation for my composition in that, you know, he had this idea of this 30 minute piece with this absurdist um, script by Kenneth Patchen and just like these kind of nonstop sound effects that create the composition. Um, and so, um, you know, we talk about immersive. Um, I don't think, I, I, I'm interested in creating an immersive experience even if the narrative isn't something that one can follow in a linear fashion. Um, okay. Um, before going to Judith, um, could you talk about this idea you mentioned in an interview um, for the Bandcamp magazine of treating things people don't regard as musical in a musical way, and on the other hand, treating musical instruments in a non-musical way? Could you elaborate a little bit on that thought? Sure. I mean, and I can provide it an example that ties Judith in. I have a composition called Swan, and the cello in that piece becomes this kind of anachronistic uh, foghorn out in the sea. And, you know, then I'll take something like the radiator from the, my old apartment and try to turn that into a percussive instrument. So, um, yeah, kind of switching the roles of the way we expect to listen to two things. Mm. Are you one of those persons? Actually, this question can go um, for both of you. Um, 
as an abs I, I think the technical term is absolute uh, here or absolute listening who can uh, instantly recognize the, the note and the pitch of everyday sounds um I'm not sure if you mean that different than like perfect pitch, but like rec recognition of sounds if I were listening to like music concrete, uh, probably could not determine the sounds. I I'm asking this uh, question because uh, a while ago I was interviewing this jazz musician in the street in Lisbon. Uh, we were um, at a cafe outside, uh, uh, outside at the cafe and we were talking and there was this construction site um, close to the to the place, and the guy was mentioning the notes in which the you know the drills and 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 all the 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 the, the banging on the walls uh, and he was being upset uh, by it that uh, because the noises because he could recognize the notes of the noises the pitches of the noises he was kind of it, it was disturbing the conversation and this ties into the other uh, thing that we should talk in, in a little bit of um you know the the the, the audio ecology concepts etc cetera, etc cetera. but um as i said um i would like to now um direct the, the conversation to 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 judith um you know you have a very impressive curriculum i was reading it online of course and you have uh, worked extensively on you know what we could call at the lack of a better term um, more exploratory fields of music. So the cello is a beautiful instrument with a very long history, but the fact that works have been written for that instrument for centuries doesn't mean, and I'm asking, that it's not possible to experiment new ideas on it, or is it? I mean, I think like the, the question of new and historic is, kind of complicated <laughs> mm. in a way. Um, so like, I guess if you're thinking from like a European center, then like course, the, yeah. the cello is a historic European instrument. If you're thinking from the context of so-called Australia, it's a new instrument that was introduced, you know, not very long ago and so it has a settler colonial heritage but it's actually like in the context of that place it's not a very old instrument either um <laughs> like in terms yeah. of timelines um and i also kind of like i don't know i always sort of struggle with this idea of like newness that like okay. sort of like the aim of experimentation or exploration is necessarily always about like newness and discovery because i think those are also kind of like tied in with like that kind of like colonial approach to music making as well so i think for me it's like i'm more interested i guess in maybe like shifting the kind of way you think about those things as being like more about like uncovering or going like deeper into certain things rather than always trying to sort of um be like oh i found a new a new sound because like mm. often so often also like those things that come out like in a composition framework are like so often like owe their lineage or heritage to like other musical cultures as well so i think like maybe there's like a more interesting way to like think about like what it means to kind of like explore like musical space or harmonic space or compositional space with this instrument. And I think like for me, the more interesting thing is about developing a different relationship to that instrument okay. that is like um, more lateral and more responsive and more kind of like meeting the instrument on its own terms rather than necessarily like coming from a place of like mastery or virtuosity, if that makes sense. Of course it makes sense. Of course it makes sense. Um... You uh, and, and you were uh, now talking about mastering the instrument. Uh, you have collaborated with lots uh, of different artists and composers, and that requires uh, uh, its own set of of uh, skills, wouldn't you say? To be open to the other and to be open um, for the unknown uh, possibilities of collaboration. Yeah, for sure. I I guess like um you know um. 
I guess that's the same kind of framing of like meeting something on its own terms. And I guess I'm just thinking about the cello as like a, a non-human collaborator in that sense. Okay. So that like, it also kind of like generates or gives you certain kinds of responses and material to work with. And then um, like a lot of the composers that I really enjoy working with like a vet or like someone like Sarah Hennies or like um, kind of more like, I guess like older generations of composers like like Alvin Lucia or something. It's like they're still kind of looking for that kind of like uncovering something together um, and exploring those spaces, not necessarily about like um, Im imposing something on either the instrument or the space or the audience or the the performer, but sort of like working on on something together that sort of like exists in a in a different kind of framework than that kind of like master interpreter thing okay challenging the hierarchies yeah but i think it's also one of those things where it's just like i don't know i i, I guess it does challenge those things but i think you can just do those things without necessarily like trying to flip or invert or go against something it's like it can be kind of like um, more generative and less kind of antagonistic. Like it doesn't have to be like a battle, like if you choose to work a different way, course, if that makes sense. Perfect sense, I, I see. Uh, back to you again, Yvette. Um, your work, as I said before, also deals with the concepts of audio ecology and the effects of sound on the human body. Um, the body has maybe never been so political as it is today. So would you say that your work is also political because of that? I mean, I probably would not say that. I mean, I think my interest into acoustic ecology emerged naturally. I have, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles. I lived in New York City. I lived in San Francisco. Um, and then before going to San Diego, I lived in the mountains in the middle of, you know, relatively in the middle of nowhere for four years. And so when I arrived in San Diego and specifically La Jolla, California, which is, I guess, a wealthy suburb of, well, of San Diego, um, I became really disturbed by the amount of constant noise. So everywhere from military um, air traffic um, to, you know, tourist helicopters, lawn blowers, leaf blowers. It, it felt to me like the noisiest place I had ever been. And um, so it wasn't necessarily a, a political, you know, taking any stance, political stance, other, but more the more of a kind of investigation to these changes that were happening in my own body and beginning to wonder, um, how these external sounds that were penetrating the domestic space of my home were having effects on both my um, psychological and physiological health. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you know, I think a lot of cities, if you look, there's municipal laws about noise um, and, you know, it, an acknowledgement that certain, you know, prolonged exposure to certain durations um, can have effects on the health, but at the same time, you know, you can find ways to bypass this. So um, my, that kind of set me up for this exploration of soundscape composition and which I think about and I guess it, explore um, just like the ways that low frequencies um, in particular um, affect the body, but then also using these ideas and concepts as part of my compositions. Okay, but, cool. Yeah. Can, can you talk about the, the work that uh, you uh, will be premiering and Judith will be performing uh, at the Sydney Brev 2021 festival? Um, could you talk a little bit about it? Sure. Um, it's called Generations and it's about, I guess, a three hour composition with four channel um, audio and live cello. So the audio is fixed media and the cello is live. Um, 
And um, the initial idea I had was when thinking about generations was about, you know, four generations of people because in, in the midst of the pandemic, um, when listening to various responses, both about the, about the pandemic itself, but also just, um, uh, you know, protests that were happening in the US and other things happening around the world, um, the way that different people would talk about how they were processing all these issues seemed to not connect from generation to generation. So I became interested in that. Um, I don't think you'll hear that in the piece. I think that more um, informs me in the way I mm -hmm. organize the sounds and compose the piece. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 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 Luis was telling me that um, he, he sent you, um, I imagine, photos or maybe even um, uh, video footage of the place where this is happening? Um, yeah, I had a choice of spaces. Um, and uh, so, I mean, that was helpful to think about where it would be and how people would come in, in and out of the space, but also, um, you know, Judith's experience of actually being there um, live. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think in, in when he first approached me about this piece, um, you know, I wanted to have Judith be a part of it. Um, and I think it's more than the cello itself. Um, I like to compose or create, and this, in this case, it's mostly improvised cello, but I like to um, collaborate with specific people, not necessarily um, specific instruments, although I, I may gravitate towards people because of the instruments that they play. Um, and so, um, yeah, I don't know. We had a chance, Judith and I had a chance to hang out um, a few months before the pandemic and explore some sonic possibilities. And so that's still in my mind as, a, as we're approaching this piece. You, you, you partly answered something that I wanted to know about uh, if, if the uh, cello part uh, was uh, completely written or if it would be open for uh, improvisation. Uh, you, you, you mentioned it will be mostly improvisation, but uh, are you notating some guidelines for it or uh, giving some instructions to, to the performer? Uh, I mean, we've had conversations about this. Um, and in general, I like to, because I choose to work with specific musicians, I want them to be themselves. And I like to work with them because of the way they express themselves mm -hmm. through the instrument. So, um, um, yeah, so in a lot of ways, I mean, there's a, I, I assume there's a, a mutual trust between us as collaborators. But um, I mean, there's some notes just because it's a long piece of, being able to keep track of what is happening, where and when, um, but it's you know not each. I'm not dictating every sound. I trust Judith and the sounds. So it's pretty can. open, um, Judith. How does um, a piece like this, uh, you know, is approached? I'll, I'll, uh, because I'm guessing that it's even physically demanding. Uh, it's a long uh, form um, work uh, and. Uh, it will um, require some kind of, uh, um, you know, preparement for it. Uh, how, how are you approaching it? Um, well, I mean, I feel like just to sort of continue on from kind of Yvette's thought mm. there, like, um, uh, you know, I, th I think like the idea of improvising in this context is also like very specific for me. I've worked with Yvette for a long time and um i i feel like i play and inhabit a particular kind of space when i'm working with yvette's sounds okay. um and that's based on kind of like yeah this same idea of like a resonance from the time that we have spent playing together in person i think like still kind of like shapes the choices that i make and things like that um so it's not like um I, I think it would be kind of a misnomer to think of this as just like a free thing. Um, also, like a lot of the work that I make, for instance, or a lot of the work that I do is like 
um, not necessarily notated, but that doesn't mean that it's not composed. Of course. And and I I think like like oral and oral traditions of transmission are like really important, like in this work and also in like me and Yvette's musical relationship. So I think that forms a lot of what's going on here as well. Um, in terms of duration, I guess I I have I do or I have done like a lot of um durational work um with with other composers but also like of my own and mm-hmm. things like that so it's um I mean it's a particularly it's it's a very particular space that you enter like when you know that something has like a certain amount of time to unfold and it sort of it changes the way that you approach something so i think like coming into a durational work it's like it's kind of like your sense of orientation shifts in a way because you know you have like so much um temporal space to inhabit and it, it and uh, i think it does really interesting things like in terms of like choices and like the body and how how you kind of like ground into a space when you get to spend several hours there so it, i don't know it's kind of I, I think it'll be interesting for audiences because um i imagine there'll be a lot of kind of like in and out kind of things so it, mm-hmm. it's like interesting when you're kind of working on one temporal level and other people are sort of like having these kind of like experiences like it's like it's like a strobe kind of you know mm-hmm. illuminating mm-hmm. something for maybe like the 15 or 20 minutes they're there which is kind of also an interesting idea i think that there's this kind of this larger structure that people can kind of like get glimpses of or ground into like as they choose mm-hmm. you know th- th- this is a question from someone who doesn't play any instrument so i'm sorry if it's if it doesn't make sense but um, what, what's your mind frame during these durational, um, uh, you know, performances? Because uh, do you, I don't know, do you zone out, or are your your thoughts working in some special way, uh, or, or do, do you don't even remember thinking about anything when you went the performance? You know, honestly, I'm not sure if it's that much different. Like if I'm playing a five minute piece or like a five hour piece, I think like the particular space that you inhabit that i inhabit or that i you know i can only talk about myself that i inhabit when i'm performing is like very particular and it's um a bit, it's being really present with the sound uh in this really specific way and it's so it's not sort of like bound to like the length of the piece or something but it's just that like a different length of piece will sort of draw on different kind of um internal resources and things but really for me it's just about like um really being like present with the sound so kind of having this kind of uh connection between like body and instrument and hearing that sort of um yeah it's sort of like being outside of normal time if that makes sense yeah i just want to add one thing to that um just in response to kind of the zoning out question, because um, when I'm composing the soundscapes, that is a meditation in and of it. Like the process of composing it is meditative and the composition itself, I think is a meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also, you know, I think of this as a duet between Judith and myself. And so even though I'm not going to physically be, you know, there at the festival, I am, you know, as composing this, thinking of us playing together. So it's, it's, it's like, yeah, the time thing is, is interesting. It's, a, it's, I, I do think of it as a live duet, even though things are not happening, you know, necessarily at the same time, but also um, back to the kind of free improvisation um, question. I mean, part of our conversations in the process of creating this piece, you know, I have concerns about like, how long can you play without, you know, fatigue or injuring yourself? And that shapes the form of the soundscape itself, right? 
Um, and so, yeah, all, all of these things are tied together. I just love that we're finally, f we're, we're like doing like time and space travel with this. Yes. Place. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, without you know wanting to spoil uh, to spoil too much the, the the surprise that the show will be for sure. Um, w will you be performing your instrument completely acoustic, or will it be processed also? Um, I would say gemischt. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> I, I'm going to keep that kind of ambiguous. Okay. Um, the, I, uh, we have discussed that the cello will um, be able to move between acoustic and non-acoustic spaces uh, in the piece. Um, but um, in terms of things like processing and amplification, I mean, I feel like those a, like also like a very specific kind of like set of questions like in 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 terms of the instrument and that also like there are kinds of processing that can occur acoustically for instance like in relationship to the space and then there are also you know interactions that happen like between um in in amplified space so i think you it, it it will it will change um, dimensions. I'll, I'll just add. That <laughs> I I said that this is a duet, but maybe really it's a trio because the space is the other part exactly. of that. So, you know, yeah, I think. Or, or maybe I'm even take, a, a quartet space. Oh, time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's it's lots of people are involved. The pet, you know, the audience the space itself, but in terms of, you know, some decisions, um, you know, Judith ear in the space will have to make some decisions. I think both for the fixed media part and the cello. And I think, yeah, we've worked together long enough that that trust is there. You know, it's um, now uh, October, 2021, and here we are talking on Zoom, um, the world has changed, as we very well know. Um, I, I'm not sure, Judith, uh, if you have been performing in public um, recently or, or, or not, but how did this whole situation um, affect you? Oh, I mean, that that's like a, that's a whole can of worms. Um, uh, I, I have recently been performing in public. Okay. Um, it has changed my life. I, I um, couldn't return to my country of citizenship because of um, the borders closure being so strict. Um, I spent three and a bit months on a Finnish island with hundreds of geese. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now I live in Germany, which was never part of my plan. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's it's been interesting, and um, um, I guess very challenging as someone who kind of like predominantly kind of thought of themselves as a most of my work and even like development of my work takes place in performed space. Mm -hmm. Um. So I don't know. I, I I spend a lot of time alone, making things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say when when you were mentioning that there's that uh, saying that goes something like life is what happens while you are busy making plans. So uh, and 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 this whole situation puts you in a different context. So uh, I'm sure something good. Uh, has come out of it also. Um, what, what, what about you, Yvette? How, how have you dealt with this? Um, well, generally, I'm a recluse, but um, I like that. To, I like there to be choice um, in, in that situation. I mean, I I guess I was able to keep composing. I heard many other people who you know refer to themselves as recluses or introverts saying, "Oh, this is great. I'm I'm used to this way of being," but I didn't have that response, um, definitely. Um, because 
<laughs> for me, 2020 was going to be about kind of branching out from this solitary practice of composition into a more collaborative um, live performance interaction, which, you know, got thwarted by the universe. Um, but I mean, I don't know, in, so, in some ways I was able to focus on different parts of music making. And I think I def definitely have had a lot of time to reflect about what is next. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, that's been an important part of the growth. So I guess, yeah, growth has continued during the pandemic, mm. um, musically and personally. I found it uh, very funny that uh, one of the texts, uh, 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 actually, it was a, a review of your work, uh, saying something like, someone in Hollywood, please give um, this composer a call. Uh, so what you can't disclose is that you are doing the next 007 film <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. No, no, no. It's, it, I can't say it is all connected to the next evolution of um, my radio operas um, oh, cool. in which I'm forging into interactive radio opera. Um, I'll just say that. Um, okay. And I'll, yeah, there's a lot of spaces in Europe where I can, facilities where I can work on this development. Marvelous, marvelous. So, uh, and finally, Judith, um, after uh, Braga, uh, where will uh, life take you next? Uh, actually, I immediately after this festival, I start a nine-month residency in Stuttgart at Schloss Solitude. Stuttgart. So uh, for the next, you know, which is, you know, exactly what you need after a, a year and a half trying to make work alone in a box is to move to a different box, but in a castle that's called <laughs> Solitude. I hope no one from the fellowship is watching this. No, no I'm, I'm very grateful to be going and... Uh, It's a really amazing and supportive residency, and uh, I love the forest. It'll be great. And I will get, sure to, see I'll get to see Judith in Germany. Um, yes, next month. We're, yeah, we're going to hang out in November. It's very exciting. Yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you so much, both of you, for taking the time. Um, for this little conversation uh, and all the best to you. And uh, I hope our paths also cross sometime in the future. For sure, in Braga, uh, I will be able to meet Judith and one of these days, uh, you also, Yvette. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us.